Um, I added this lecture this morning, um, and uh, since it's a lab demo, I thought I'd do it first uh, while it's still running. So this is uh, this is PowerPoint uh, PowerPoint something not not two PowerPoint. I'm gonna get it out of the way. I can't see what number it is. Um, uh, four, five dot four is where I'm at. It's a short PowerPoint. It's really not, you know, if you, if you haven't downloaded this one, don't worry. Uh, I will, I will get the um, gory details all worked out. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Any questions before I, 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 I did not do what Austin asked me, and that to give you some more update on the project, I will go ahead and get that on my to-do list um, so that you have a way to plan. Uh, that's my intent as far as you do the labs, one, two, three, four, <clears throat> that you <clears throat> sort of <clears throat> uh, do a lab, one, two, three, four on uh, whatever base technology you're gonna use for your project, okay? That's, that was my intent. Uh, or not, I don't care, it didn't have to. Okay, uh, we're still in chapter five, which is the wireless personal area network. And so again, the, the context of this is you own both nodes and you control the physical access to all the nodes. And therefore you control the physical access to all of the software, okay? Now you may be buying software or using software you don't understand, or there may be agents out there that are trying to steal your stuff, uh, but nevertheless, you are interacting with essentially trusted components. That's what the idea of a wireless personal area network is. And uh, I was told to do this six months ago, so I knew of its existence, but I finally got around to doing it. Uh, and that is a packet sniffer. Now, um, I haven't tried it on, um, on Bluetooth or Wi-Fi that's not TI. Okay, the demo I'm gonna do here today is uh, uh, three TI tools, uh, three TI launch pads, um, where we're going to essentially attempt to debug the communication protocol using a packet sniffer, okay? So uh, the, the, the application is uh, uh, you have a network, and this is a, a person area network. Um, and and this, this, is, uh, this is essentially one of the lab ones, okay? So on the bottom two launch pads, um, I have uh, a lab one running with a sub gigahertz, uh, channel zero um, communication from the sensor to the collector. As we'll see in the lecture that I have yet to give you, uh, that the collector is the is the master of the architecture, the the PAN uh, coordinator, the personal area network coordinator. Well, again, I skip the lecture. We'll go over that. But it turns out the collector is sort of the master, and then you can have multiple sensors and create a mesh network, or not a mesh network, a star network. <clears throat> um, but I don't, my star is pretty boring. I got one collector and one sensor. Okay, so the bottom two microcontrollers are essentially the network. The third microcontroller is a agent. Obviously this, this uh, you know, this guy right here, that's wireless, right? That's wireless. And the idea here is sensor data goes that way, acknowledge data goes this way. Um, this connection is a USB cable, okay? Um, hooked up with some, with two, uh, with two pieces of software on the PC, uh, the installation of which is very tricky. And so I will try to work out a, uh, a process for you to, um, to, um, to check it out. Uh, so my, I guess what I'll probably do is once you're past lab one, uh, I'll 
go into checkout and divide the, uh, the well, or you can just check them out, um, that this uh, guy is already, there's a bunch of them, six of them or so in checkout. Uh, now they're, they're in two, of, two inside each box. But anyway, so what I'm gonna do is run a, um, run a, uh, a sniffer agent, which is a TI tool uh, first, and then open up Wireshark uh, to, to see that communication. I do believe that's all my slides, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing over here. And then start sharing over here. All right, um, okay, so physically, I have two of these uh, HC, um, I have two of these HC uh, um, 1310s. Now I would have done the 1352, but I put them all in checkout. So um, the 1310 is like the 1352, except it does just does sub gigahertz. It doesn't do Bluetooth or anything else, Big B. It just does um, sub gigahertz, okay? Uh, okay. All right. Okay. So now over on my other computer, I have the 1352 connected. Um, and like I said, I first launched the uh, sniffer agent. I first launched the sniffer agent here, uh, which, which is the physical connection to the 1352. Uh, and it's over there the other side of the room. Uh, obviously not, it's wireless, uh, but close, real close. And then I w launched Wireshark here and I scroll up to the top and, okay, it's not all the way to the top. Oh yeah, sure, you can see some stuff happening. Um, and this is the song and dance that they, um, uh, as I pushed buttons, on the various devices, um, there was a. Um, let me open this a little bit more. Let's see. Uh, okay. Um, we'll see in the slides that there are um, uh, there there are there's a there's a unique, very long MAC address for every physical device, and then once you create a personal area network, there will be a short not necessarily unique 16-bit uh, address. And that's, um, that's these guys here. And so it turns out AABB is my, uh, my PAN coordinate, my personal area network coordinator. And then the 002 is my sensor. And then I, I hit the button and disassociated, I unconnected from the network. And so then when I reconnected from the network, uh, it, an association request, uh, then I got a new, the same board got a new 16-bit uh, address. And then I was wildly pushing buttons and disassociated it again. And then I did, okay, I did. Uh, yeah, I disassociated it again and then associated it for, uh, you can see it's the same MAC address. Uh, this is the MAC address of the sensor. And then it's reset to a, um, to a, another, another, um, uh, you know, local area network. Uh, what else can you see? You can see, you can see the packets, right? You can see the packets coming across. You can see uh, um, when it's, when it's not connected, uh, we'll talk about what beacons are, but um, when there's nothing connected to the personal area network, it'll throw out beacons. Um, and, and then, um, you know, there's a beacon uh, response. So this did a beacon request saying, you know, hey, where's my beacon? And then this is doing, this is here, I'm a beacon. And then at that point, there's a window and we'll see the slides in the next one where this can associate, okay? 
And so uh, the, the sensor associated with the beacon. Well, the cool part about the sniffer here is uh, you can push the buttons on, on the device and you can see this is a data flow. This is a, this is a continuous data flow um, situation where data is constantly flowing uh, from, from the sensor to the, to the collector, right? Whatever, so many, uh, whatever that is, every four, every six seconds, yeah. Approximately every six seconds, you can see it does a, 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 uh, a packet send, okay? Uh, somewhere embedded in here, uh, this is the actual, th here's the actual protocol. Um, this is the actual message here. And you can see there's the, um, uh, you know, there's the destination address. Um, okay, so um, I just got this working about 20 minutes ago. So I was excited to show it to you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and write up some more information. Um, see if I can get the same sort of thing to happen with my Bluetooth connections. Uh, and that way we can um, potentially delve more. Now it's not quite radio level. You know, we talked about the fact that these things here are, um, you know, th these bits are sent out as, as physical layer devices, but it's pretty low level in terms of what it is. Uh, that this device is doing. So it's called a packet sniffer. And as I said, it's, um, it just requires some sort of third party. Um, now, according to the directions, if we encrypted this, uh, we could have we could have used this same thing to decrypt it. Um, uh, this is obviously not encrypted. Um, but anyway, I'm, uh, I just was eager to show it to you as a way to, uh, so the moral of the story is uh, of this particular, um, okay, put this out of the, seriously. The moral of, the, of, of any story is um, uh, use, spend all the money you can afford to buy debugging tools, okay? Um, and, you know, this is probably not the best tool nor the only tool. But in this context here, uh, people say, what's the, what's the hardest thing about electrical engineering, right? If you, you talk to a high school student and, um, and you say, you know, let's be an electrical engineer, the biggest pushback you get is, I don't know, I'll let you answer that question. What do you think the hardest thing for a high school student to uh, to grapple with when they are asked, do you want to be an electrical engineer or a mechanical engineer or a civil engineer, or biomedical engineer, all the other beautiful an aerospace engineer? What do you suppose is the hardest thing that a high school student, a high school age person has to think about? Is it gonna be hard? Nah, okay, it's already the hardest. Okay, so we tell them right up front, of all the engineering, electrical engineering is the hardest. Okay, fine. Now, compare it to mechanical engineering. Compare it to what you learned in physics. I mean, you can't, it's hard to see and touch. You can't see it. Yeah, that's it. That's a totally, you can't touch it. Now, power engineering, I guess you can feel it if you get shocked, but um, electrical engineering is very hard to see. Okay. And that's my motivation here. And within electrical engineering, wireless is even harder to see, okay? Uh, but yeah, that's my, um, yeah, that's my, uh, so that's the, that's, the, that's the takeaway from this slide is if you can afford some debugging tools, then uh, it's definitely worth your, worth your effort. Um, yeah, I, I don't know quite. I'm going to try to run this tool on, um, like I said, on my Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Um, and if I can get it to run, I, I may stick, stick the, uh, take the kits apart and stick one of these in the, in the, 
uh, depending on how far your class has gone, you may be past. I may have missed it. Okay. That's this one. All right. So, yeah, Okay, yeah. Yeah, we were this is where we left off last time. Um uh, I didn't give you a chance to uh pose your uh my hypothetical question, not a hypothetical, my uh historical question and uh what was your favorite toy at, uh, as a child? Got any updates on me on my on my very interesting, my very I'm very curious about what it is. Uh, I had like toys called uh, Dino Riders. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can go find them on eBay. Yeah. So was it like was it? Uh, they were like dinosaur toys. Yeah, they were dinosaurs. Right, they right. Put like harnesses on them, and they fought each other. And uh, yeah, they need to bring them back. I really liked Lego catalogs, not actual Legos, but the catalogs that. I oh, okay, yeah. okay. When I okay when I was my dad had it. He he sold furniture, and so he had a furniture shop. And in the office was a one an adding machine. It had a piece of paper on it, and you typed in the number and you hit plus, or you you actually pulled it like this, and it would add up the numbers. And I would open the Sears catalog. And I would see if I could spend a thousand dollars buying stuff uh, from Sears. It took me obviously that was. Wait, when you were four? That that's. Uh, I oh no, that not was four. Hard. I was uh, much older. I was sorry. I was older. Fair enough. Four. I loved trucks, trains. At four, I loved and shovels, digging. Yeah, trucks and trains. Yeah, I also really liked trucks. Yeah. Yeah, see, Austin, so Ian's uh, doing. Anybody else have a? I think when I was four, that was the height of the, the Beanie Baby bubble. And so my mother would buy me a bunch of those and then hopefully sell them later, but I don't think it really worked out. <laughs> Good. I had a remote control car. I, used to play, I actually still have that one, the one that I used to play with. And now it's like a memoir kind of thing. All right. Well, that's good. I, uh, fine. I, I'm curious as to see how things. Okay. So, all right. Um, <clears throat> if you remember uh, way back, beginning of the semester, uh, we introduced the HC12 as an, in one of the examples of a. Um, uh, sub gigahertz. Now it was 433 megahertz. Um, and in the previous part of this lecture, we, we talked about uh, baud rate, channel, power, uh, transmission modes. Um, and it's in this code that we actually establish. Um, uh, okay, so um, uh, here is the here is the AT command to set the baud rate. Um, yeah, here is the command to set the channel. Okay, let's see my cursor. There's the channel. Uh, and obviously, you had to set the two channels uh, to each other. If you notice, there's no addressing here. Okay, in the sub gigahertz uh, um, IEEE 15.4 example that we'll do next, uh, devices will have addresses. But then this is such a simple protocol, there are no addresses here, right? It's just, it's just open, it's just the wild west, okay? Uh, there's the power level. Now this is not a set, this is a read. Uh, and so, uh, and we saw the different um, the different transmission modes. You could set the mode, but this one here was just what mode are you in. Uh, and similarly, so so this was you know this was optional because it was um, it's just informative. This one was optional too. Again, to read the firmware. Okay. 
Uh, and then in this particular protocol, when you set whatever bit number this is, right? Whatever, whenever you set that pin uh, to a zero, uh, that meant it would take AT commands. And then when you set uh, set to a one, uh, now anything you send to this device is just going to be broadcast and ex well and hopefully received by the other device. So uh, in this particular, yeah, there's the uh, there's the this is P three dot zero, okay, uh, which is the set pin on the on the device. Uh, do you remember what this was? This, this syntax structure on the Cortex M. Uh, so the TM4C did this. This um, um, this is an MSP432 code that we're running on here. Uh, another Cortex M. Is that bit specific addressing? Almost. This is bit banding. And all Cortex, uh, all Cortex uh, uh, microcontrollers. Cortex M microcontrollers do bit banding. Uh, uh, bit specific addressing was only uh, was only and and for the rest of you this this one will not be on it. This might be on your test, but this one won't. Bit specific addressing uh, was only on the TM4C 123, and this allowed you to uh, this one allowed you to read and write any combination of bits, any GPIO bits. But it was just the data, by the way, it was just the data bits. Bit banding allows you to do one bit, any one bit, okay? But the cool part is it's any IO address, as well as RAM. Any RAM location in any IO register location and any one bit in there can be accessed um, uniquely, okay? Um, and so why is this like totally awesome? What are the two things that make bit banding totally awesome? It's totally predictable. There's not any critical sections. Uh, no critical, yeah, the, the first part, totally irrelevant. All code is predictable, right? Even random number generators are predictable. Um, but it is not critical. In other words, uh, if you do a read, modify, write, or in this case, a write um, uh, to a specific bit, uh, it is not critical, okay? because it does not affect the other seven bits in the register. Okay. Now, this happened to be bit zero, and so I did read and write a zero, a one to it, zero and one, but it turns out with bit banding, regardless of the bit number, whether it's bit zero or bit 31, uh, you read and write zeros and ones to it to make it work. So it is not critical. In other words, there is no critical section, no non-atomic read, modify, write. Now, if you do a, you know, if you do a set equals set exclusive or one, that's a read, modify, write to a permanent variable, but it's still not critical because at least relative to the other seven bits, because this occurs in hardware, okay? This will not affect the other bits of the register. Okay, what's the other reason that this is awesome? Can we give you reasons why it's not awesome? Sure, I'll take it. Makes your code harder to read. Interesting. Okay, so you must not like driver code. Well, you have to know what that register is doing if you're going to. Uh... Yeah, but, but but this is the set bit. Okay, fair enough. A code should always be interesting. Read. I, uh, if you look at the HC12, set is one of the bits, one of the hardware bits in the interface. 
Well, I don't know if I wrote a picture. Is there a picture of it? Well, you can't see it, but one of these is the set bit. I forget which one. Fair enough. Code is only good if it's easy to understand. Okay. And yeah, you're gonna put you're gonna put it in a bad category. I'm gonna put it, uh, I'm gonna put it in a good category, but that's fine. But easy to understand is important. But there's one more very cool thing about this bit banding um, function from a microcontroller embedded system interface. And it's friendly. What does that mean? What does friendly mean? Okay, I'm so sorry, bug. It waves at you when you debug it? <laughs> no, no, no I, there was a moth flying by, I had to kill it. Okay. It doesn't mess with like any of the other bits. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't affect any of the other bits. The purpose is to, is to clear bit zero, to clear P30, P3.0, or to set P3.0, and it does not affect any of the other bits, okay? Which makes your code more modular because port three bit five may be part of some other module. Um, and therefore you may not, you may want to, you know, disconnect the interaction between modules. So that's what friendly is. Okay. So um, this is the main program. Uh, well, you can see that uh, it called it called the code we just did. Uh, this particular uh, starter code uses um, the serial port for debugging and uh, sets up a um, a hundred hertz background task. Um, uh, this uh, basically executes the wait for interrupt instruction, which puts it to sleep. Okay. Wait, sorry, can you go back just one more time to summarize non-critical and friendly real fast? Yeah, sure. Totally separate things. I'm only asking because you said it could be on the test, so. Oh. Yeah, sure. So yeah, that's usually Keyshawn's uh, responsibility to. Um, okay. All right. So we need to make a critical section. Uh, we need uh, three things. We need a global. We need a global uh, global object, either a a a variable. Uh, or a register, IO register. Uh, we need a shared global register. Okay. And we need a non atomic, uh, a, a, a non atomic sequence. That means it can be interrupted. Um, uh, and we need. Them, this is typically just going to be a white. And so the, the typical things are uh, read, modify, write, uh, write, write, um, write, read. These are sort of classic sequences that can cause a critical section. Um, all right. So, for example, the um, if I do a okay, wait, 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 let me see. Okay. If, I, if I just do that same sort of thing that I was trying to set bit three, right? So if I do a uh, p three dot or p three arrow, I think that's the right one. Or equals zero okay, this is the classic way to um this is the classic way to uh set right and i'm trying to 
set equals one, okay? That's what I'm trying to do. But what this breaks into is uh, LDR R0. And this is not Code Composer Studio. Okay. Okay, so that fetches the address of P3 out, and there's probably no dot in it. So you got the address of it, and you fetch the contents of the R. So this is why you took 319K, because you can't figure this crap out unless you know assembly language. This is what I mean by non-atomic sequence, right? These are just going to take this going to take four instructions, or particularly three instructions, to um, to set the bit. Okay. Uh, okay. And so, if an interrupt were to occur, right? here or right there in some other thread right and some other thread uh, executed that's this guy so we got a second thread and let's let the other thread uh, set bit you know, some other bit, bit seven. I'm going to set P3.7. Okay. It's going to go the same sort of code. Zero, okay. And then if I were to X, this is a critical section. So if I were to get an interrupt in either of these, this is in one thread. And so if I, oops, I just drop it down here. Okay. Um, that this, um, uh, so the, so the, the, the order of operation here of execution, one, two, okay. And then I get an interrupt and then I execute three, four, Eventually, it returns and executes this one, seven, eight. Uh, it messes up. Yeah, it, it, you don't get the right answer. Okay. Because when you execute, this is the, this is, this guy here is the, is the mistake. And that is once you read the context from um, memory, uh, from the port, you get two copies of it, one in R1 and the original one. And so when you go back over here, uh, you refetch it, you fetch the old one. And then this is going to set the bits in the old one. So in particular, if there, if both bits are initially zero, okay, and you execute this code in this sequence, what happens? Let's say, so thought question, okay. P3.7 and P3.0 are initially zero. And so if you execute them both, you want them both to be one, right? But what do we get with this one through eight? What do we get? Only bit one is set. The only bit zero is set. Okay. Now bit seven got set temporarily, but then it got reset. Step six will set bit um, will set bit seven, but step eight will reset bit eight bit bit seven. Okay. Um, now the code looks identical, 
right? The code would look identical. If you did this, it looks identical. But you get some weird address here, right? That's this guy over here, sorry. I didn't mean it to be that weird. All right, you're gonna get that. So it looks identical, but because this is this is a bit banded address, this write function only sets bit zero. Okay. Is it I mean because you're oring them, wouldn't they both be set? No, Sorry. no, no, this is hardware. No, they no. When you read from this address, you only get bit zero. You don't get bit seven. So this R1 here can only be zero and one, regardless of the other bits in port three. Whereas these give you all the port. What's the difference between this and bit specific on the okay. T4C? Um, this is less flexible. Um, in other words, it will only do one bit. You can't like, if you have a four bit stepper motor, you can't associate an address with four bits of the of the port, um, and so this only works with a single bit. Oh. But the advantage is it works with all the registers, like the direction register or the, you know, some mode register, or, uh, or all of RAM. All of RAM is also bit banded. So you have an address for every bit in RAM? Yes, you do. You do. Yeah. Yeah, if you if you if you kept either your 345 445L book or your 319K book, you'll see it. Or if you just Google bit banding, it's it's pretty ubiquitous. It's called bit banding. But it removes the critical section. Okay? All right, now friendly. Friendly. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, that's the definition of, of friendly, to change the bits in which you are interested. Okay, um, so in this, these are all friendly, by the way. All of these are friendly. They're critical, but this only affects bit zero, and this only affects bit seven, uh, you know, so. Copy. Uh, this one's also friendly. And equals, okay. Uh, I don't need these. Okay, so let's do, this is equivalent to, uh, let's not do that, let's do this guy. So the, in this case here, I'm trying to clear bit, uh, trying to clear bit, uh, um, P3. Mm 
uh, over here. I'm trying to set it. Yeah, uh, this is actually kind of ridiculous because uh, since you only do one bit, the or equals is kind of a wasted effort. Okay, so. So these are accesses uh, that are friendly, right? Clearing a bit, setting a bit. It only affects the one bit that you're supposed to do. Um, but the second one are, uh, are uh, critical. Did that answer your question? It, it just allows you to interact with the other bits, uh, to not interact with the other bits, to leave the other bits For example, this will clear bit zero, right? But it also, if there are other output pins, will also clear all the other bits, right? So, so this is unfriendly. You know? How do you have that many like address or how do you have that many addresses? Oh yeah, it's easy. Can I do the math? Do the math for me. Okay. Uh, let's just do it on RAM. Okay. Let's just do it on. Uh, let me go back. Yeah, bit. I'll, I'll do it here. All right. So, put um, Now you you don't you don't you can't bit specific the ROM just the RAM, but uh, but we can add up. Uh, add up all the I/O space. Uh, pick any pick any microcontroller that you know the answer to. How much ROM do you have? Uh, how much RAM do you have? And how many I/O registers are there? Right. Uh, the 432, by the way, has got 256 kibby bytes of ROM, uh, 64 kibby bytes of RAM, and I don't know. Eight could be bytes of I/O device. I'm just guessed on that one. Okay. That number is uh, way less than two to the. Uh, okay, two to the two to the ninth, uh, two to the nineteenth. Um, Trying to make that a superscript. Yeah, I right there. There we go. All right. That's how many physical locations in a in the 432 you have. And your microcontroller of fun may have a few more RAM locations or a few more I/O locations, uh, but okay. Now tell me how much, uh, what, what's the address space on the Cortex-M? How many different addresses are on this microcontroller? How, how wide's the address bus? Okay, wait, what? I mean, you're not chatting it because I don't have my chat open. Oh, this is a 32 bit. 32 bits. And so how much bigger is 2 to the 32 than 2 to the 19th? A lot bigger. Okay, so Keyshawn, uh, the address space is virtually empty. I see. Okay. So you have plenty of spaces to put, plenty of spaces to put the... Um, to put the uh, yeah to put the space in there. So is it done in hardware the mapping or in software? Oh, absolutely. That's why it's not critical. Okay. That's why it's not critical, because the hardware's done in because um, the mapping's done in uh, in um, yeah because the mapping's done in hardware. That's why it's not a read. But that's not that's why it's an atomic read modify write. Okay. Uh,
10. Here's the picture that I'm referring to. This is a, obviously the, the TM4C123. Um, uh, and uh, so any address that begins with 2-2, two, two, you see it right there? Any address that begins with 2-2 two, two is a bit banded alias of one of the 32 Kibby bytes of RAM. And any address that um, that begins with a 4-2 is a bit banded alias of the, yeah. And okay. All right, back to work. Sorry. Does that answer your question, Austin? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. All right, so where was I talking about this? Man. Okay, let's see here. Um, wow, this is pretty uninteresting. That, like I said, is the wait for interrupt instruction. which puts it to sleep uh, until an interrupt comes by, okay? So main count is the number of interrupts you've had, okay, in this, con in this program, okay? It's the number of interrupts you've had. Uh, and then the interrupt, okay, sorry, I put that in the wrong spot. The interrupt um, is a periodic interrupt, which um, performs both the input and the output uh, once a second, it will send, you know, either the 31 or the 30, zero, you know, either the 0x31 or the 0x30, okay? This particular starter code. Um, if you have your finger on the button, so if you push the button, then it will send data. When you don't push the button, it doesn't send data. Okay? And <clears throat> basically the HC12, uh, essentially just replaces a, you know, three wire serial cable uh, such that whatever you send is then received on the other device. So uh, there will be a, uh, an associated second copy of this. on the other device and um, this guy uh, talks to that guy all right um I showed you this before. Uh, there's another bit banded output, but what is, uh, what is, uh, why do I toggle it three times? You see it? One, two, three. Oscilloscope. Yeah, so if you see this on the oscilloscope, um, you're going to see two toggles here that are really close to each other a third toggle there and then a long time before it toggles three times again. Okay. And so this time here is going to be the whatever, 100 hertz, 10 hertz, what was it? Uh, 100 hertz. So this time here was going to be 10 milliseconds. And this time here is what? This time here is virtually zero, right? Toggle it twice takes nanoseconds. But what is this time between here and there? between where and where again? 
between the second toggle and the third toggle, right? One, two, three. One, two, three. There's another one. Again, this is virtually zero. Isn't that the whole send receive transmission? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, don't remember there's a separate chip. Okay. This is code in the 432. Yeah. All right. So the there um that's 432 code. There's a whole nother microcontroller here. Uh, which one's which here? That this one's probably the microcontroller. And there's a third trip, which is the transceiver. It doesn't really have anything to do with how long it takes it to transmit and receive. Because the four, 432 has got a UART here tying to this 8-bit microcontroller. Okay, yeah, so but, I guess I, I misunderstood your word transmit. Well, you're sending that whole thing to the to the other guy, to the to the seed like you're talking about, but then you do an in on it. What, okay, getting back to this picture here, what is capital T in the in the measurement? normally some sort of period i know but what what does it mean okay how about how about this uh can you guesstimate how long it is you're running at 9600 baud yeah right you're running at 9600 baud uh with uh with a 15 kilobits per second air baud rate what's t gonna be Yeah, this is really a 445L question, by the way, in case, you, in case you're totally confused about what I just did. Well, for some reason, I'm kind of blanking on what you're looking for. Is it 1 over 9,600? No, no. Uh, let, me, let me give you the legal answer, and then we'll give you the estimation. Capital T is the execution time of the software between this line and that line. Okay. All right. That's what I did. I, I toggled yeah. it. And then I executed software. And then I toggled it a third time. Okay. But uh, assuming, you know, it doesn't take any time to do read the input pin, and assuming it doesn't take any time to execute any of this code, the question is how long does it take to execute that? Okay. Right? Yeah. At 9,600 baud. And so, yeah, in all fairness, I need to, uh, I need to, uh, okay, get rid of this crap here, just a minute. Oh, I could open it up for real. Let me just, uh, let me just, uh, let me just. Uh, okay. So at 9,600 baud with a 100 Hertz interrupt, at 9600 baud with a 100 with a 100 hertz with a 10 millisecond period interrupt at 9600 baud what's the busy bit in the output channel in other words when it gets to this uh, is it going to wait? Is it going to spin? Or is it not going to spin? It's received it. It should not spin because then the busy should be one, right? 
Okay, this is not receiving, this is transmit. Okay, it's a very simple, it's a very simple uh, uh, thought exercise here. All right, and that is uh, at time equals zero, assuming it's transmitting, at time equals zero, it does an out care. And that time equals 10 milliseconds, it does an out care. At time equal 20 milliseconds, it does an out care. You with me? That's the way this thing works. Yeah. Right? And at 9,600 bits per second. Well, wait, it's 9,600 baud per second, right? So if we're sending a signal or like QPSK, then it's really oh, times you're, that, you're, right? You're missing the boat. It's not, it, this is the channel between, between the 432 and the, and the, um, this is the interface between the 432 and okay. the um, and that's BPS. Uh, STM bit. Okay. So yeah. our baud on UR is always one simple. So baud should be equal to bit rate then. Yeah, so you're dividing, you know, eight tenths. Okay. So, you know, at 10,000 bits per second, and you're going to send 10, uh, you know, 10 frame, 10 bits per frame, uh, it's going to take you about a millisecond to do this output. Now, there's a FIFO in there, you remember. There was a FIFO in the other guy, in the transceiver. Mm -hmm. But uh, and it takes only uh, one, okay, this takes 10 divided by uh, 9,600, and that's going to be in, yeah, that's going to be in seconds, okay, for the UART to work, okay, which is about a millisecond. So what's the busy bit? Can you go back to the code? Well, this is the code. Yeah. Because you know there's no while loop in here? Yeah, it's just the one sin for that piece. Yeah, the this is no while loop in here. This is a Valvano rule, okay? No backward jumping in the interrupt service routine. Okay, so is the busy bit the LED out? What? Is the busy bit then the LED out? Because that's when it's doing something? There's no, there's a busy bit. There is a while loop, but it never spins. Okay. Okay. The busy bit is, is always zero. In this context. So is there a place where a busy bit would get set to one or are we? If you, if you swap the, if you're interrupting it, let's say you interrupted at 10 kilohertz, right? Then yeah. this thing would stall. If you ran okay. this faster than a millisecond each, it would stall. Okay. So the fact that we're not running faster than that and our, we assume we're the only one outputting to the out jar. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so then wait for busy equals zero. That's just something that outchar does inside yeah. of its yeah, function. Inside its out chair, but it never actually waits. Okay. Okay, and so the answer to this question is uh, this is essentially zero as well. Okay, I mean microseconds, not milliseconds. Okay, uh, let me show you uh, non block. Uh, now it's a different busy, so it's a if uh, data ready or whatever it's called.
So it's either going to return you the result or return you a zero. Okay. So how long does that take to execute? It should take effectively zero, just zero. because so it, yeah, it's in not going to spin. Effectively zero. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So your point here is that in the handler, we don't have anything that's going to spin. Yes. Okay. And that's good design. Yes. That's okay. good design. And if I were to, uh, if I were to, let me draw. Let me just draw it here, so I can next next year I can I can uh, shapes. And this is what I call T right here. T. And then we need one more of these. Right here. And then let's put a let's put a railroad bar in here. And then we had this is later. Okay, and then the last thing I was trying to make a point is, is that this is something interesting. Uh, what is this? So is that basically asking what is the percentage of T compared to the entire yeah. thing? Yeah, that's that's legally what it is. But what is it? What is it emotionally? Your um, duty cycle, like your busyness, how much time you're yeah, actually you, spending. Okay, so if you're a good man or woman, okay, what should this number be? Well, it should be hopefully much less than one. Yeah, it, it should be less than one, okay? Because if it's greater than one, well, then, yeah, then it doesn't work. Right? Uh, if it's much less than one, you're awesome, okay? If it's 99%, uh, you know, in this particular case, in this particular case, if it's 99%, uh, whatever, it still works, but not yeah. very well, right? Because there isn't any other interrupts here. Yeah. But it's like the uh, CPU time that it takes. This is the uh, this is the, the this is a called a profile, and this is the this is the uh, CPU utilization. That's the actual word I'm looking for. Yeah, that word was escaping me. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And the cool part is, if you spend enough money. Um, then you can make the you can make the um, debugger measure this for you, okay? And you can spell utilization, utilization. okay, all you want, okay? Can you just do that with the discovery? If you're measuring the LED, 
and toggle pin. Yeah, well, you can see it with your, but you can't see. Um, no, what you what you see, what you, what you're going to see with your eyes on the LED is the hundred hertz waveform. You're not going to see CPU utilization because it toggles three times. Okay, now if you only toggled it twice, yeah, that's a, that'd make a great quiz question. Okay, yeah, sure. What if I took this guy out? Well, you still have an idea of how long you're in the interrupt. Kind of. Okay. If I took this out, um, and assuming this made it go high and that made it go low, what would you now? What would you have? And it were an LED. Uh, the brightness of the LED would be your CPU utilization. Just answer the question. All right. Let's not do that. Yeah. Okay, so that's why my code triple toggles, because it allows me to measure CPU utilization, okay? as well as measure the time between interrupts. Okay? okay, and I understand triple toggles, and this is this is probably a really early question and something kind of dumb, but triple toggles allow you to have that really short understanding of when it starts and how much is actually being used in the code, yep. but the double toggle doesn't allow that. Well, you just you okay. A double toggle would you don't you basically wouldn't have this guy. Yeah, right? and sure you could. It just you would need an oscilloscope. Yeah, it. so a, it just makes it toggle, easier. A double toggle, uh, basically the light would either be totally on or totally off. It wouldn't flash. Uh, yeah, so yeah, double toggling is fine. Uh, you know, it's not, I'm not. So, but like if I had a double toggle and I had a logic analyzer or a, a scope, I could still measure yep. CPU utilization. Yep. Yep. It just and wouldn't it have the nice sharp yep. edge. Yep, it wouldn't be, uh, it would be less intrusive, right? Because there'd be uh, fewer fewer lines of debugging code. Nope. Yeah, and then you get the less, um, yeah, the less nice period switching yeah, at higher know. frequencies. Just, um, you should always use your tools, right? So having a logic analyzer is very helpful, okay? And, you know, this whole debugging thing probably took 50 nanoseconds. Um, a double toggle would take even less with bit banding because all you have to do is write a one, write a zero to the port. Because again, this is this LED out is a bit banded. Okay, so I've killed that today. What time is it? All right, I got it. I got it. I got it. Let me finish something. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, we um, what was what were the takeaways here? And that is sometimes you buy something and you have no idea how it works. It just works. Okay, uh, and that's my frustration with the HC12 uh, is it was very easy to get it working. Right, there was Arduino code, and all I did was convert C plus plus into C, uh, or I just used the Arduino. Either way, and it was real easy to get this this running. Um, it's it's wicked simple, right? I mean, uh, this um, this wireless protocol, uh, and uh, those of you who checked out. Um, it has the great advantage of you being, it's so simple, uh, you really should be able to understand it, everything about it. Um, and it does allow you to build a, uh, your own protocol on top of this. Whereas we'll see in the next sub gigahertz, the um, IEEE uh, 802.15.4 um, it's already got a protocol built in, uh, and we saw with the demo, it already had addressing and and you know beacons and and joining and addresses, and so it was a much more robust, much more um, you know full functioned. But it had the disadvantage of you're not going to be able to figure it out. Okay, even even as simple as something as simple as IEEE uh, uh, 802.15.4 um, uh, it, 
Yeah, the only thing that would make this totally awesome is if I could get myself uh, hooked up to the to a you know high frequency scope, and we could actually see uh, we could actually see what um, what what is being sent here uh, on the airway. But, uh, next time I teach this, this will be awesome. I'll have my I'll have my real oscilloscope uh, to to demo in class. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, stop share. Um, I'm at a stopping spot between, um, yeah, I'm, the next one I'm going to do, uh, I, I have uploaded, um, and that is the, the, uh, this one here, three, um, some information on IEEE 802.15.4 as implemented on the 1352. Uh, that's what we're going to do next. And again, this stuff is both in the data sheets for the 1352 and on the, in the chapter five of the book. Uh, questions? Oh, you can't see. Never mind. I stopped sharing.